and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get the news and new game releases from December 1986. I check out some bonus audio tracks. I play some older games. Take a look at a newer title. Jeff gives us another hidden gem. Jason continues his game development. And I finish off with some serious software. But first, it's the news. The new budget label, 299 Classics, run by Elite Systems, is being shut down due to license issues and software suppliers being unhappy with how the company has been administered. The label was set up by a company named Foundry Business Systems, strangely operating from the same address as Elite Systems, and they were to release old classic games from various software houses for just $2.99. Titles released so far include School Days and Full Throttle, but company boss Steve Wilcox claimed they cannot keep up with demand, and this was the reason for shutting down. However, several companies who supply titles to Wilcox are taking legal action claiming breach of contract and non-payment. Vortex Software, one of the suppliers, were not even aware that Foundry Business Systems were in fact elite systems. Does any of this sound familiar? Last month it was reported that Boots had stopped selling Amstrad's new machine due to poor quality control. Although now it is thought the problems are not as widespread as expected, both Amstrad and Boots are not making any statements at the moment. Previously, Boots made several issues they were concerned about known to the public, including lack of external tape player, misaligned tape heads, poor volume, lack of standard joystick ports, and bad TV picture. But at the moment it's all gone very quiet. Later in the month, more problems were identified, including slowdown of the basic editor for long programs. For example, listings with over 3,000 lines of code became impossible to edit, making the user wait 2-3 to three seconds for each key press to be recognised. CDS have released a new type of computer game that is a cross between a Monopoly style board game and a football strategy game. Not only that, but they've managed to sign up a football legend to have his name associated with it. Brian Clough's Football Fortunes includes not only a computer game, but also a large board with cards, money and pieces to move around. Other elements include buying and selling of players, getting sponsorship and trying to balance the books so you can pay wages. Despite having the manager's name against it, Brian himself had no part in creating the game, with all the work being done by CDS. The long-lived software house Microgen has been bought by Creative Sparks. One of the few surviving independent software houses, they had been looking to expand recently, but the only way they could survive is to follow the trend and join a larger company. It is expected that Microgen will continue to produce titles, but they will now be marketed by the ever-growing Creative Sparks. And now on to the top selling games. New into the charts this month comes Cobra, the film tie-in from Ocean Software. The Great Escape, a 3D survival game again from Ocean. Avenger, the gauntlet style game from Gremlin Graphics. 1942, the arcade conversion from Elite Systems and Gauntlet, the official arcade conversion from US Gold. And that was the news and new game releases for December 1986. of Doomed Ark's Revenge, The Ice Mark Chronicles, Chapter 1, Peace. From the very early days of the record industry, the B-sides of singles rarely got mentioned, and were sometimes just fillers. The software industry too, in its early days, began to see the value of additional content, mainly attributed to Automata UK, who included bonus songs on their games. Right, hands up everybody who thinks it's a flower show, come on, come on, let's see some life in you lot, come on. Down at the alley pally, 
Up up on a table. As time slipped by, there was not much movement on this, but slowly companies got on board and began to use the audio tapes for more than just game data. content included music, usually from the arcade machine the game was based on, like Afterburner or Outrun. Some companies included original music, written specially for the game, like Microgen's Everyone's a Wally. Now Wally was a builder, and he had to build an house. He knew the basics of the trade, but hadn't got the nouse to lay the bricks, dig the drains... Or Taking things to the next level, some companies began to include mini-stories or spoken backgrounds to help the player get more involved. This included the James Bond material, released as part of the Sinclair Bundle. Ah, oh, there you are, 007. I thought you were never going to answer. Now, sorry we had to conceal this radio receiver in your new shotgun stock, but it's the only way we could be sure of contacting you. And, of course, Doom Dark's Revenge, from Beyond Software. I, I thought he was dead. I thought the war was lost and midnight doomed. Rejoicing? I thought they were rejoicing for Doom Dark's victory. I thought I'd found it, and destroyed it all in vain. Too late to help, too late for anything. I don't know where I've been since. Another market for this type of material is educational software, and we get some nice, if a little weird, inclusions here. Once upon a time, an old man went out to plant a turnip. Grow, little turnip, he said. Grow sweet. Grow, little turnip. Grow strong. And the little turnip grew sweet and strong and big and enormous. They were also used for instructional purposes, like the Sinclair starter pack. This program is intended to show some of the uses of the inky string command. But it also aims to show just how friendly your spectrum can be. Please keep two things in mind. All very useful for beginners. Celebrities sometimes got in on the act too. Ted Rogers provided the bonus tracks for 321, the computer game. Hi everybody, I'm Ted Rogers and I'd like to invite you to an exciting new way to play 321 with me all year round. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun and if you feel like laughing, applauding or generally making a fool of yourself, well then you just go right ahead. Now look, whatever you do, don't unplug your spectrum between phases or all your scores will be lost. Just look for the instructions and pull out your earplug, okay? And the Thompson twins also introduced their adventure which came on a flexi-disc, strapped to the front of a magazine. Hi, it's the Thompson Twins here. I'm Elena. I'm Joe. And I'm Tom, and you're listening to the computer game version of Doctor Doctor. It's a pop music adventure all about us, with lots of prizes for the first people to solve the puzzles and phone computer and video games with the answers. We've got t-shirts, albums, posters, and for the first person to solve the adventure, two tickets for our next concert and... An there are some truly terrible ones. very 80s cringe inducing ones. And some good ones too. It really is a mixed bunch as you would expect from this often self-made material. The company who started all of this took the whole thing to the next level with Deus Ex Machina. Automata produced a track that was to be played simultaneously as the game progressed. Eased its sphincter. The last ever mouse dropping caused a slight accident. You may control the progress of this accident on my And they got some top names to do some of the audio work like John Pertwee, the former Doctor Who star, and Ian Jury. 
What you got? I'm a fertilising agent. My brothers are all wriggly. I'm a fertilising agent. The track explained things and it was timed so that every stage of the game coincided with a change in the audio. Very innovative. The game, sadly, didn't get the recognition it deserved, but thanks to the Spectrum community, this and other examples have been saved for posterity. I spent a good few hours going through these, and it was interesting to see how different companies that opted to give bonus material used the time and space. If you're a rookie American football player, this tape will help you to understand the game and get the most from your Ocean NFL Super Bowl computer game program. Some just threw songs on there. Others tried to immerse the player into the game and some were obviously just for fun. But do remember, they were put on the B-side for a reason. They were meant to be heard along with the game. So next time you're playing something, make sure you're not missing out and check out to see if there's any bonus material, even if it ends up being absolute rubbish. By the way, where'd you meet him? I met him at a micro fair. His gobbling made me stop and stare. That's when I fell for the leader of the pack. This is Psst, which is difficult to pick up on a microphone, but was released by Ultimate Play the Game in 1983. Psst was one of the first batch of games released onto the unsuspecting public by Ultimate, the others being Cookie, Transam, and my all-time favourite, Jetpack. Each of the games were totally different, and each were later released as ROM games for Interface 2, and each of them were just 16K. The game then sees you controlling Robbie the Robot in his interstellar garden, trying to cultivate his prized Thagodian Mega Chrysanthodil. And luckily there are a mass of things out to eat the plant, including space slugs, leeches and midges. Luckily though, our Robbie is prepared with various sprays to put a stop to their antics, and hopefully let his beloved plant reach maturity. He has three cans of spray, each a different colour, and each colour will only kill one type of pest. As each arrive on screen, you have to guide Robbie to collect the tin, pick it up, and kill the hungry beast. Each level sees a different collection of the three pests to deal with in different configurations. Some just cross the screen, others head straight for the plant and start sucking the life out of it. Periodically other items will appear in the wall that if collected will help the plant grow quicker. Things like a trowel, water and compost. Once the plant reaches maturity it will burst into bloom and that marks the end of the level. One in five flowers will reveal a special treat too, but I won't spoil it for you. The graphics, sound and presentation are all excellent, as you'd expect from Ultimate. Each pest, Robbie, the flower and additional graphics are all drawn with great detail. The sound which is different for each type of spray is well used and control is responsive. This is a great little game and reflects the company's arcade heritage. It's a pick up and play game, but due to it being only 16k, the replay value is limited. There are only three sets of pests and one type of flower for instance, and there's great scope to expand on this given that the 48k machines were available. As it is, it's a great game, and one that I can recommend for a quick blast of pest control.
This is Light Force, released by FTL in 1986. A distress call has been received from the outpost of Regulus, asking for help to defend themselves against an attack from an unknown origin. As the only Light Force fighter close by, you are dispatched to assist. Yes, it's a shoot 'em up, and a good one too. When the game was released, it was considered a technical marvel due to the colourful graphics, smooth scrolling and apparent lack of colour clash. Starting in deep space you get asteroids, alien ships and huge alien cruisers to deal with. You have to be careful though as not all aliens can be destroyed and you have to dodge them instead. This nasty trick is repeated across all levels but you soon get to recognise what to avoid. If you're good enough, you then get to descend onto the planet. Here the graphics change to a jungle world, scrolling smoothly as you battle your way through the hordes of attacking fighters, whilst also trying to destroy ground-based targets. The next level throws you into combat with orbiting platforms, again with ground-based targets and swarming aliens. Onwards to the next one then it's the ice planet to fly over followed by an asteroid belt, which is where the game takes you back to the first level and things just repeat again. This game is hard, very hard, and I had to use the RZX playback to see some of the later levels. The graphics as you can see are well drawn, with clever use of colour, they look really nice. The scrolling is smooth and the landscapes are detailed, all very non-spectrum really, especially when you consider when it was released. Sand consists of just firing and explosions, but with almost constant action, there are hardly any places in the game where there isn't any sound playing. Control is via keyboard or joystick and is nice and crisp, and overall it's an exciting game to play, with a great feeling of achievement when you complete a level. For shoot 'em up fans then, this is highly recommended, but be warned, it's hard. Only good players should apply. This is Wonder Chars, released by Dave Hughes in 2011. This is a strange game that soon becomes highly addictive and infuriatingly hard, but that doesn't stop you going back to try again. The sign of a well thought out game. The idea is simple, you have to collect the fallen UDGs. Or for those that don't know what that means, use a definable graphics, which are blocks of 8x8 pixels. Yes, it's that simple. But there are a few rules to follow. You can only carry three UDGs at a time, and when you have them you have to upload them by going to the upload pad at the bottom right of the screen. Once uploaded, you then have to recharge by going to the recharge pad at the bottom left of the screen, and then you can go and collect another three. To complete each level you have to collect 96 of them. Each level has a theme, and takes the form of old game images, the type you usually find in typing games or very early Spectrum releases. There are things that get in your way too. The first level has a centipede-like thing and you can't destroy it. You just have to dodge it and try and collect the falling blocks. If you let three of them drop to the ground, it's game over. So you have to be careful. Later levels have more tricky things to avoid such as jellyfish, men in flying saucers and skulls. And the screen soon becomes very full. Graphics-wise, apart from the UDGs, there are some nice sprites, and everything moves really smoothly. Sound consists of various beeps, and luckily for this type of game the control is responsive. It isn't long before things get hectic, and the difficulty slowly gets turned up. A great game then, very addictive and well worth tracking down. Today we're going to take a look at a game from 1983 called Smuggler. 
Smuggler was released by CSS Software and according to the World of Spectrum website was written by T.R.A. Hainsworth. And it's another one of those strategy games where you type in the numbers, similar to Football Manager or another one of the gems that I've looked at in this series, GB Limited. Smuggler is a trading game, so you start the game with a boat and a amount of money and you have to buy and sell commodities and ship them to different parts of the world and trade them to make a profit. You can start the game at various difficulty levels, but the only difference that really makes is how much money you start with, how big your overdraft is, and what class of boat you start with. Throughout the game you can buy and sell boats and upgrade your boat. Doing that gives you a boat that is a bit more rugged and robust, so it'll be able to weather out more stormy weather as you sail the seas, and a larger cargo hold. Now I find that that ends up making the game harder at the easier difficulty level, so I tend to play on the medium difficulty level when I start. The instructions to the game are actually available in the game, and if you look at them it will tell you that at certain ports, certain of the commodities you can buy are always within a fixed range. So in England you can buy tools and those tools will always be within a fixed range of price. Similarly in Ireland whiskey will always be within a certain range. It's a good idea to have a look at those prices when you first start playing the game because that can really help you. Now the name of the game comes from the fact that you are able to smuggle your goods when you arrive at a foreign port. So you start in the UK and you can buy goods there. One thing you have to remember to do is once you've bought goods is transfer them into the hold of your ship. Now the reason you have to do this is that you can actually buy more goods than your ship can hold and they'll stay in your warehouse while you sail around the world so you need to make sure that your hold is full before you set sail. You then set sail, and before you set sail you'll actually be given a breakdown of the costs of your journey. Then off you go, and when you reach your destination port you're given two options. You can pay excise duty or you can smuggle. Hence the name of the game, Smuggler. If you smuggle your goods, you won't be able to sell them straight away. You'll have to move them to your smuggler's cave. And then you'll have to set sail again, go on another journey, and then come back to that port and smuggle the goods from the cave into your warehouse. Now, that actually takes quite a lot of time and ends up being quite difficult. And I find that I never end up doing that. I always end up paying excise duty in this game. Maybe it's me, maybe I'm just too much of a law-abiding citizen. But on the other hand, once I've sailed the seas with my goods and seen the price at the destination port, I always think I just want to sell them and get my profit, so I might as well pay excise duty. This game came out some three years before Elite, but bears a lot of similarities to the way that you trade and made profit within Elite. Basically, you buy and sell commodities. Now, unlike Elite, it doesn't have wireframe graphic combat between your different destinations. It was written in BASIC, so I think that would be a bit too far to go. However, the seas that you sail do have some hazards. Every day that you're at sea, you'll be told the weather forecast, and you can either put into a safe harbour or you can continue your journey. And if the weather gets too strong for your boat, you might have to jet in your cargo, or in a really bad case, you end up losing your boat and arriving at your destination with absolutely nothing to show for your efforts. There are also pirates. If you sail to some of the more exotic locations, such as the Barbary Coast, you run the risk of being boarded by pirates. What I tend to do in this game is stick around the safe ports, trading between the UK, France, Ireland and Holland to build up a bit of money and upgrade my boat, and then set sail for some of those more exotic ports. One thing I have found is if you buy cheap gold and sail through seas where there are pirates, you always get boarded. There's no way to make a quick book. I'm quite a big fan of this kind of genre anyway. I really, really like this game, but this is another really good example of the game. As I've said a few times in this series, if you're just a shoot 'em up fan, then this won't be a game for you. However, if you like something a bit different and something that's a bit of a strategic challenge, then I'd highly recommend this game. People who like games like Football Manager or A Rockstar Ate My Hamster should really, really give this a go. It's not the most sophisticated of games. It came out in 1983. 
To be honest, it isn't the hardest challenge you'll ever find. Another one of the games like this that I've reviewed in this series was GB Limited. And I think GB Limited, managing the economy of the UK, is slightly harder than trading commodities in a boat and making a profit. Which is probably true to real life, to be honest. But if you've ever fancied yourself as a bit of an entrepreneur who would love to be your own boss, sail the seven seas and haggle and trade, maybe smuggle, maybe take the risk of running foul of the law and smuggle your goods between your boat and the warehouse to make a profit, then this could be a game for you. I find that it's a really good one for a kind of rainy afternoon where you've got a bit of time on your hands and you just fancy something a bit different. So that's Smuggler, another highly recommended game, a game that doesn't normally appear on people's top 10 or even top 100 lists, but one worth seeking out and playing. It's available for download on the World of Spectrum website, so if you want something a bit different, something you might not have played before, I recommend it to everyone. Go and download it and give it a whirl. So until next time, happy gaming! As the game moves closer to completion, more problems arose, and as any developer will tell you, you always find decisions made early on were more than likely not the right ones. As more and more elements of the game were added, the use of machine code became a necessity, and this wasn't the original plan. This meant that the bits of machine code already added were done in an ad hoc fashion, without any coherence. When it came time to rework the basic berserker firing routine into faster machine code, the project reached tipping point. Jason needed a better development environment to keep track of and modify the smaller parts of the Z80 already written. After a lot of searching, he finally found ZDev Studio, a nice GUI that utilizes Pasmo in the background. He then began the task of moving all the small chunks of code into the new environment and modifying them so that they eventually would sit in memory in one block. With a few changes, this also meant he could use shared variables, instead of each routing having their own. This would be a lot of work, but it had to be done before the game could continue. Once all the modules were in place, Jason could at last begin the work on the Berserker firing routine. After several attempts, he finally nailed it, with a very flexible routine that is, actually, better than the one used in the arcade machine. The logic would be that no Berserker would start firing until the player has moved through five screens, and would be relatively light until screen 12, where all hell would break loose. With this important piece in place, and the development platform now stable, work could continue to complete the game ready for release. Jason decided that, instead of the relentless arcade mode, he would add an exit point to the maze, that the player is guided towards by an arrow somewhere on screen. This gives the player something to achieve, rather than just pointless blasting. There's still a lot of tidying up to do, and the main basic code needs all the smaller machine code parts removing, as these are now in the development environment. And of course, there's the speech to finalise. But that is in the next instalment. For basic programmers, Sinclair's built-in debugging tools were a bit sparse. You did get syntax checking and error messages, but very little in the way of proper debugging. If you wanted that, you had to look to a commercial product, such as Super Toolkit from Nectarine Software. Released in 1983, the package came with a tape, on which were versions for 16 and 48k machines, an empty tape, and a small manual. On the tape, there's also detailed information about how to use the program, that basically covers what's in the manual. The package contains 11 utilities to help you debug your own programs, and these were renumber, list variables, trace, keyword replace, block delete, memory map, header reader, crunch, memory used, program length, and free memory. The program itself was about 2.5k long, and could sit in the background as you typed away your basic listing. To enable it, you called the code using randomised USR 62839, at least according to the manual. I found that it was different from the version I downloaded. To demonstrate some of the tools, I quickly knocked up a little basic program that allowed you to move the letter A around the screen. And when ready, I could break into the program and enter REM. This initialises the utility. 
you can now access the functions by pressing the enter key and the key representing the specific tool. For example, the renumber function, you press enter and R. You are then asked which line to start from and the space between each line. If you set this to 10, for example, then your listing would be 10, 20, 30, etc., depending on your start line. This function takes into account things like go to and go subs too, but does not handle calculated versions of those commands. To get a list of variables, we press enter and L. To see how long a program is, we use enter and P, and to see the available memory, we use enter and F. The crunch option is not what you'd expect, and simply strips out all the rem statements and unrequired colour codes and spaces, and tidies things up. It's not actually a cruncher as we know it today, but it may be useful if you are running low on space and need to clear away some junk. The trace program is very powerful and allows you to step through your code command by command. This will help you locate any errors by displaying where the program is at any given point. The block delete and keyword replace does what it says, but the memory map displays lots of technical information for those that need a deeper understanding of what the machine's doing. One for advanced programmers then. Overall, this was a useful set of tools for any serious programmer. I say was, because in 1983, things like this were quite rare. Today, of course, with emulation, this type of utility is all but redundant. But back in 1983, it was certainly a nice thing to have. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.